Welcome everyone, so let's get started. Uh, it's a special pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Kelly Santiago. She has um, uh, got her master's degree in the active media program at the University of Southern California. And actually towards the end of her master's, uh, she co-founded and then was also president of a game company called That Game Company. <laughs> and it's actually one of the most prominent uh, brands in the uh, indie uh, game space. And during her tenure there, there were three major games released um, called Flow, Flower, and Journey. I think many of you have heard of them or even played them. And uh, they won many awards and were also commercially uh, very successful. And what all these games uh, actually um, made to do, um, achieved to do, is, is really um, showing how video games can be an art form and also really um, generate deep emotional experiences uh, in human players. And she was uh, credited, uh, she has received many awards uh, for work. For example, she became a TED Fellow. Um, she uh, was named one of the most, uh, 10 most influential women uh, in uh, uh, video games uh, of the last decade. And she also received from Microsoft um, a Woman in Games uh, Lifetime Achievement uh, Award. And currently, uh, she resides at Google uh, Play Games, uh, where she's a partner manager uh, for indie uh, game developers. And so it's a special pleasure to have her here, um, giving her talk with the title, The Artificial of Games. <laughs> Welcome. So yes, I'm Kelly Santiago. Uh, I am a game developer, um, producer, and advocate. That's kind of what I've found to unite all the different threads of my interest, especially in independent video games. Um, I believe that games can be both deeply meaningful and wildly entertaining. Uh, and I create work and talk to demonstrate that. Um, and one of these talks that uh, I, I happened to do was a talk I did at USC in 2009 called Video Games Are Art, What's Next? Um, which one year later would get picked up by Roger Ebert and launched kind of a large scale online debate about whether games were art. And seven years later, it still delightfully haunts me. And I say delightfully because for better or for worse, and I'll kind of get into both sides of that later in this talk, um, the questions I raised in that talk are still questions for me and I think for many of us um, that work in games. And I think it's easy um, when you're far out of academia now and that I'm long into a career in the game industry to kind of forget or ignore these questions, um, somewhat ironically forgetting them since you kind of become more empowered to actually answer any of them. So maybe like most things, uh, also as I've gotten older and more experienced, I'm even less certain of any of the answers I thought I had back then. So as I was preparing for this talk and how to update you all on what I think about video games as art, I was kind of becoming more and more wrecked, uh, really not knowing what I should say and sort of continually looping around into questions myself. Um, not knowing how I should really go about presenting my thinking of the last seven years. So uh, I thought maybe just trying to get you into my own headspace um, would help. If nothing else, maybe we'll have mutual insanity that we can work through together by the end of this talk. Um, so to get to my headspace, I wanted to show you this montage I created um, from journey footage from beginning to end. And I think there are definitely ways in which uh, the game itself kind of reflects a lot of the thinking I had over the three years that game was uh, being created. Um, but I'm also going to talk through sort of that thinking and the process of making it as we go through. This will be sort of step one into, into my mind, <laughs> for better or for worse. Maybe that's the title of the talk. Uh, okay.
So in the beginning, there was what we felt really was our calling. Genova and I wanted to make commercial games that express different emotions, demonstrating that video games were capable of expression just like any other artistic medium. As gamers ourselves, we felt there was a huge segment of the gaming population and possibly non-gaming population that were no longer being served. Uh, here in the US, we rate games with adult content M for mature, but we wanted to make games that actually were mature. We wanted to play games that provoked us and made us think and affected us. Um, but we didn't want to spend 40 hours on a game in order to in order for this to happen. We wanted to make games that express different emotions but were accessible to anyone who wanted to try them. So in the beginning, there was a summit. Uh, online multiplayer was really the last frontier of the PlayStation Network that we were working on, um, which we had really yet to work with. We hadn't done any online games as artists. Um, so how could we take what we had learned about making unique, uh, unique emotional experiences in Flow and Flower and apply them to an online multiplayer game? What did it make, mean to make an emotional multiplayer game? We decided to really challenge ourselves. Online console games are known for leaving people with a disdain for humanity, because uh, so often you get online and you're only to be yelled at by a 13-year-old across the world from you. So we wanted to make an online game that instead left you with a renewed sense of humanity. And in the beginning, there was a story. Genova and I were at a luncheon, uh, actually with alumni of University of Southern California. Um, by happenstance, we sat down next to uh, this man, Charles F. Roden Jr., um, who was a former space shuttle pilot. He had been on three missions to the moon. In every case, he said, the mission specialist who walked on the moon began the trip as an atheist, but returned to Earth a more spiritual human being. Genova thought this might be because when you get to stand on the moon and you look back at Earth, you experience a sense of awe and wonder, something we don't often experience um, anymore because we are so, we're so techni technologically empowered on our, in our everyday lives. You know, we can travel at hundreds of miles per hour, we can work in buildings taller than the clouds, we can connect with anyone, anywhere, at any time. And our video game lives are similar. Most video games are about acquiring and using power. And because of this, we don't pay attention as much to the actual people that we're playing with. But what if we created a game that stripped away your power, that put you in a foreign place in the harsh environment of a desert, where you didn't even know who you were or what your purpose was? Could we create an online experience that actually connected you with a stranger? Well, we enlisted additional help. Uh, a woman who has spoken here, I think last spring, Robin Hunnicky. She had recently been on a real trek of her own through the mountains of Bhutan. Uh, there was an artist with a multidisciplinary background in creating arts of various styles and genres, and developers with families that came from all over the world, all bringing their unique perspectives to this game. We traveled to the Oceano Dunes in California. Uh, we hiked, we meditated, we took pictures and video and drew sketches. We trekked up the sides of dunes, slid down them, and trekked back up them again. We discovered that the texture of walking in sand was something we needed to capture in our game and to give you the sense of place where every step was arduous and meaningful. It was at this time that we had some of our first really tough arguments. What was it exactly we were making? What did we want Journey to be about? But also, what were we really capable of? As a small team of only 13 people, it was important that we didn't take on a challenge that was going to be too big for us and left us feeling that we were doomed for failure. That's the loud part. It 
can be both a blessing and a curse to work with passionate artists. Uh, the blessing is that they really do give you their all. And we all thought about Journey constantly, whether we were working on it in the offices, fixing dinner, or hiking the Inca Trail in Peru, as I did. The curse is that every person feels so invested in making sure the game will be the best version of itself. Disagreements as to what this means can be very difficult to get through. And it was at this time that we asked ourselves the questions that would haunt us for the next two and a half years. Could people feel engaged in an experience that left them so helpless? Would a virtual journey through the desert be just too boring? Would players come back to play again? Would the game feel too short or too long? Would the story of the world feel too heavy handed or too abstract? Would anyone even show up to play? Uh, some of the best times of development came right before a big showing. Uh, there, these were the moments when the amount of time we had left and what we were capable of were all very tangible. And so there really just wasn't any time to have big arguments about what we could and couldn't do. Everyone worked together to make sure we would be putting the best possible representation of ourselves forward. And on future projects, I'd like to try and figure out ways to bring this immediacy into the rest of the work. Um, but maybe there's no way to replicate it. You know, maybe it's just a natural part of the rhythm of game making. Uh, you probably wouldn't expect this. I certainly didn't. But really great showings for some reason. Uh, for some of our team members, it brought on more stress than relief. Suddenly there would be an increased pressure due to a feeling that we had set expectations too high and now we had to live up to them. That the best we could do was meet already high expectations. And what we had really done was actually increase our chances of disappointing our audiences. And the more these developers were congratulated on their work, the worse that they would feel. So I'm not a cynical person. Um, I, I felt relieved after these showings um, because I trusted the opinions of the people who were seeing the game. Sure, there are some people who will celebrate anything that's simply different, but at the same time, most of the games industry is filled with really cynical people. Uh, people you wouldn't expect to try or enjoy a game like Journey. And for these people, it'd be easy to call us pretentious or artsy or just weird. Um, I believe that when an artist puts themselves into their work, when they make themselves vulnerable, it can really be felt by the audience. Uh, and I believe the same is true for games. So as hard as it was to watch my team struggle and argue and sweat through this process of making Journey, I could also see that they were struggling because they were making themselves vulnerable in, in this way. And I had faith that players would feel that quality. It was still scary to show our games to the press and the public, but when they responded positively, this was validating to me that we were on the right track. And then there's the next phase of the game development process that's both scary and a relief. At a certain point, it becomes really clear what game you need to make. Um, we knew the path that would lead us to the end, um, and we knew it was gonna be longer than we expected. And we had serious discussions about whether it would be worth it to us to take that time. Maybe Journey was good enough, and we would be giving ourselves extra work that was unnecessary. <laughs> Maybe it was a collective hallucination, but we could all see it, and we knew what journey had to be, and we agreed to make it. So I've used the word struggle a lot now to describe this process, but it was real. Each team member felt they had put 
themselves, their reputation, and their careers on the line for this game. Uh, we were running out of time, out of money. Half of us had reduced our salaries to the bare minimum in order to reach the end. Our publisher was questioning whether we would ever really be finished as we missed deadlines, missed showcases, which led us to doubting ourselves. Uh, we loved what we were making, but we also weren't sure how people were, would react to it. We were now on the space shuttle, and Earth was our game. We watched as it moved away from us, growing smaller and more distant. And for the first time, we were looking at our game as the other, outside of us, immovable. And we couldn't do anything but wait to see how people reacted. So here are some of the reactions we received. I will never know what blessed chance made journey possible, nor what strength brought your sensitive and great minds together to make it come to life. All I know is that once again, your masterpiece reminded me that I believe. I believe in the beauty of my world and the greatness of mankind. I believe in our capacity to love and communicate, and I put the whole of my trust in our ability to keep this belief alive. I have made new friends, met new companions, found new people to rely on, and I have written new stories to share my love and affection for this game and the people who made it. I add Journey to my collection of unforgettable emotions and march on to my purpose in life, preserving art and beauty with all of my passion. This game brought me to tears, and every time I think of the experience that I have had, I'm brought to tears once again. So I shall say thank you for making just a marvelous game. I cannot explain to you in words just how much I enjoyed this. I also want to thank my companion on such a wonderful journey. I just played Journey for the first time today. It's an amazing game and an amazing experience. I don't think I've ever had a media, film, television, even a play give me the same sense of togetherness and at the same time give me a sense of loneliness of not wanting to lose my companion. I'm from Argentina. I bought Journey two days ago and played it with my nine-year-old child. It's the first time that I cried with a video game. It was for us a very deep experience, bringing us into the storytelling during gaming. Your incredible game gave me the opportunity to talk with my son about him, as this amazing being who has begun his own journey. We talk about the seeking of knowledge, being strong against adversity, and it also gave me the chance to speak with my son about the human being and the environment. I learned so much about every project I work on. I learn from my teammates, from the process, from the highs and the lows, and I go through in each endeavor. But for me, Journey is really unique because I've actually learned an equal, if not greater amount from the players. I think in order to have those kinds of reactions to a game like Journey, you have to make yourself vulnerable and open to strangers. And by this, I mean you have to be open to the journey that a bunch of people in Los Angeles have created. And you also have to be open to the experience of sharing that journey with someone you don't know and who might not even speak the same language as you. So many developers, talks about, developers talk about how may, they make games for themselves. Um, I always thought myself and the people working on Journey were different because we're all gamers ourselves, but we wanted to make games for anybody, not just hardcore gamers. Uh, and we were always trying to re reach audiences, people who were not like us, who didn't have the same backgrounds or interests. But now I realize we actually wanted to connect with strangers. We were looking for an experience that would allow us to have meaningful connections with one another, and that would renew our own sense of humanity. Uh, I realized that I'd become a little bit cynical myself, and we did make a game for ourselves. Uh, the players of Journey have had a profound impact on my life, uh, one with me one that I'll carry with me in everything I work on. And I hope every game maker works to feel this one day too. And I think you can only have this vulnerability uh, through an artistic medium.
Okay, step one. So we descend. So that's where I was in 2012, and a lot of those thoughts linger in me. The trials of developing journey, the wandering path, sometimes literally in actual dunes, and the impact that it had on its audience. Uh, the feeling of going from thinking we might be the only people that really love and understand this game to these responses from players and the Game of the Year awards and commercial success, it felt like I had finally proven my point. Like games were capable of a wide variety of emotions and anyone could do this. So I'm going to go back one more step to 2009. In 2009 was when I gave the TEDx USC talk that I was referencing at the beginning. Uh, it was the first TEDx event, actually, which was an experiment into what it would look like to empower communities to hold their own TED-like events. Since then, there have been 10,000 TEDx events held all over the globe. Hundreds of these talks have garnered their own followings on the TED website. But at the beginning, at this first event, the speakers were told that among a few other handful of guidelines about how to give a great talk, that we should think about giving the talk of a lifetime. So I decided if I was going to give a talk of a lifetime at that moment, I would come out and take this controversial stance of video games are art. And actually, the full title of my talk was Video Games Are Art, What's Next? Because what I talked about was not only that video games are an artistic medium, but that we should move on from that question because past that question comes a whole slew of other questions, uh, questions that I think are far more interesting to talk about. Like, OK, so how do they communicate? What is this game communicating to me or to my family? How do I assess or discuss the quality of a game beyond fun or addiction? And as a game creator, the question, what's my responsibility in all this? And looking back, that's fundamentally what I really wanted to say, and maybe what I kind of shied away from saying, which is that video games are art, and that means we should have artistic responsibility, and as players, we should also hold the creators accountable for that. When I gave this talk, it was just after Flower had been released on PlayStation, which still to this day I think is one of the wildest video games to see commercial success on a hardcore gaming platform. Because in Flower, you play as wind, blowing <laughs> flower petals through these serene, natural landscapes. You, each level is accessed by looking at a flower on this windowsill of a gritty city apartment. And within each level, more man-made and urban structures are introduced until you're using flower petals to actually improve the condition of a city and make it beautiful. Like Journey, there's no combat, no timer. The emphasis is really just on exploration and discovery of the space. And standing at 2009, um, it turned out I had a lot of reasons to be optimistic at that time. The MoMA in New York would open an exhibit dedicated to video games. The Smithsonian Museum of American Art would host the exhibit The Art of Video Games, curated by Chris Melisinos, who would receive a GDC Ambassador Award for it. Flower would be shown in this collection, and then later Flower would become one of the first two video games the Smithsonian would add to its permanent collection. Wall Street Journal games uh, writer Jamin Warren co-founded Kill Screen Magazine, a publication dedica dedicated to this discussion of video games as an artistic medium. Events dedicated to showcasing games as a medium would grow and multiply. Indiecade, Game City in Nottingham, uh, Game Lab Barcelona, uh, Kickstarter would fund so many projects um, with a range of motivations and goals. Uh, and the there was this renaissance of board gaming and Jane McGonagall would save the world with video games, becoming the second ever video game creator to stand on the main TED stage. But standing again in 2009, there were reasons to be pessimistic. Facebook gaming would generate a style of data-driven video game development, the like of which the world had never seen. 
It led to the explosion of free-to-play, a monetization model previously only popular in Asia, really, and, and very much so in Korea, and then would move to and thrive in the mobile marketplace, where casual game mechanics and short play sessions were completely at home. The number of smartphone users, and therefore people who had access to these games, multiplied and multiplied again. The revenue generated by these titles and the fact that each title could act as its own platform, uh, reliably engaging players over and over again, which was something not possible before in games, would attract different sources of funding into video games and new types of developers. It would also, in some ways, have this really positive impact of demolishing the walls uh, gamers and the industry had built around itself, defining gamers as us and everyone else as them, because now nearly everyone plays games, and that's a pretty good thing, right? Unfortunately, the conversation about games has remained somewhat the same. Gamers are still the specific subculture, one that's violence obsessed, sex crazed, and yet completely unsexy, soda chugging, boobs obsessed, basement dwelling, trench coat wearing nerds. Video games referred to and still mainly refers to Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto. What I couldn't have possibly predicted is that there would also be a vocal community of gamers that wanted things to stay that way. That they liked the very walls that I had been working to burn to the ground. Not because, and I'm not trying to burn them to, ground, to the ground because I don't like games with guns in them. I really do. I like all types of video games. But I think in order for games to be a medium, meaning that they could have the possibility to express anything, uh, they needed to be able to say anything and be accessible to anyone. Not that every game has to be accessible to everyone, but that the medium itself could hold this wide range of experiences, and we could be free to choose from that range as we liked. And what I truly never in my wildest dreams would have imagined was that there was a violent community that wanted to keep things that way. Between the vocal and the violent, video games would become a place where artists didn't feel welcome. Yes, you could express anything in a video game, but if you appreciate your sanity, you won't. Uh, Robin Hunnicke in her talk here talked about some of these topics as well in her, uh, the talk's called Expanding Games, which if you didn't see it, uh, you should totally check it out online. Um, she mentioned Luxurious Superbia, this game developed by Tale of Tales. And now Tale of Tales have left the games industry. Um, their, mo their current project is one they raised funding for on Kickstarter. Uh, it's a VR experience called Cathedral in the Clouds, and they are not associating it with video games in any way. And in fact, uh, I think somewhere around that time when the Kickstarter was successfully funded, they tweeted out, uh, fuck games, <laughs> fuck gamers. <laughs> and it's jarring, and they certainly got a lot of heat for that. But um, it really codified that they felt like they had had to restrict their voice in games so in order not to really bother anybody. That in order to make a commercially successful video game, you also had to kind of manage this, this social component to it to be nice to people. Um, and yeah, that's, that's unfortunate when we think about them, think about games as an artistic medium. Um, because freedom of expression, of course, is extremely critical. <laughs> So, one more jump back in time. There's more of these. <laughs> Get ready, guys. Uh, to 2006. Uh, so, when Genova and I co founded that game company, we were thinking a lot about these subjects video games as a form of entertainment. I think it's kind of interesting at that time we were saying entertainment. Um, but that entertainment is this really broad field, and it's not just video games. Um, but all these different mediums and so and activities, and so what what is really entertainment at its core? What unites all of these experiences, and how do games fit within that? And we were thinking that just as humans have a desire to eat and drink, 
you also have the desire to have feelings and that they're kind of like multivitamins. Among these various feelings, you feel sort of off kilter when you haven't experienced some of them. From ancient tribes uh, to modern society, envir our environments have always involved uh, competition and stress, and many of us have problems feeling accomplished or satisfied. And this desire for feelings has been with us since the very beginning. Um, even though a civilization has changed or evolved, we've invented various means and ways to satisfy emotional needs. This is very common throughout history. And today the evolution still continues. Novels, TVs, video games are quite effective uh, sitting on the couch as a way to help you feel better, um, more satisfied. And that that's the core of entertainment. Whether it's real or virtual, uh, entertainment is a way for us to feel these emotions without embarrassing ourselves. That's why when we look at video games as an entertainment, the feelings that video games evoke is what we started honing in on. But what are the kinds of feelings that we would choose? Um, well, when we look at the established entertainment media, when people talk about them, they use words to describe their emotions. Uh, and especially back in 2006, um, it was very uncommon for games to have a similar range of emotions uh, that were used to categorize the different genres. It would be more about what the features were, um, taking the language uh, as sort of the history of games as a software product. So when you look instead as games uh, at games in sort of a range, of, a limited range of emotions, um, you can see these genres sort of emerging around stimulation, empowerment, zoning out, kind of addiction, or immersion. The emotional spectrum of video games are still heavily biased towards these emotions. Um, but in fact, that's very natural to any new media. For example, similar trends can be found in the period of early cinema. But as film and its audience grew and both and grew up, the desire for feelings grew as well. And slowly the spectrum gets more complete and more even distribution. And I do think we're starting to see that now in video games. Because there's, the desire for feelings is no different. Um, as we've grown up, while the same fun feeling still works, like I was saying, I still love shooters and online games, um, but you want something more. You kind of start to ask, like, is there anything else I can do in this space? Can games be more serious? Can we reach higher levels of joy to ecstasy? Could we actually push past um, frustration to catharsis? And there's so many space, uh, spaces still left to saturate. Uh, it's one of the things, uh, especially as a producer and an investor of video games, I get the most frustrated in seeing that it feels like there's still so much uncovered territory in games when I still see games pop up with sort of the same stories and the same mechanics time and time again. It just feels like such a waste of time and talent. But people do it because how do you evoke unique emotions? It's still a, a huge question. Because um, we can look at other media uh, but these mediums um, are more established in the vocabulary of the tools that you have when you go to approach their creation. Um, film is a multimedia, is made of moving images and sound, but it's not just good, good images and good sound equal good movie. There are other underlying techniques that are at play, um, such as cinematography and story, 
acting, all these specific discipline and skill sets that have been refined over time, some of them long before the medium of film began, right? Story and acting are things that have had long history of practices and directing. Um, so they're about how to put all these things together to create an emotional impact. The initial goal is communication, and you use these tools together to create that. But when it comes to video games, there is one more major element, which is the interaction. Um, unfortunately, video games are still in their nascent stage when it comes to establishing these, this vocabulary. Um, that was something I had to learn, even coming from that game company in which a number of us had come from game design programs, then moving outwards from that game company and interfacing with many other developers, I recognized that a lot of the vocabulary I was familiar with was definitely not <coughs> widely adopted or known within the game industry. You're still, there are still people thinking fundamentally about this limited vocabulary of video game emotions. Robin uh, Hanicki is one of these uh, people who have worked towards establishing a vocabulary, um, the MDA system. Tracy Fullerton, Jonathan Blow, Eric Zimmerman, Katie Salen, Ian Bogus, many others have made huge strides in unpacking the language of systems through which games communicate. communicate. But as I said, it's still not a common understanding. For the most part, many developers are looking at existing video games, what they really liked, and mimicking those, as opposed to starting from what is the experience I want to create, and how, how can I use these tools to create that experience. And I think that's a, a big gap when we talk about games as an artistic medium. So has it all been successful? Well, as the spectrum has filled, the medium is certainly going through its growing pains. To step back and have a longer view, this moment in time isn't the first time art has incited violence. Uh, people fainted at Beethoven concerts. People were yelling so loud at the first performance of the Rite of Spring that reportedly you couldn't actually hear the music. Uh, the first act of police violence in America was in 1849 in New York when a riot broke out after, over the casting choices of Macbeth. Yeah, Astor Place riot. <laughs> but of course, none of these incidents stands on their own as being the single cause of this extreme action or emotion. They're linked to the greater issues of their times. In this case of the Astor Place riots, it was the growing need for an American identity separate from the British. And when a British actor was cast in place of the top American Shakespearean actor at the time, people felt frustrated. And it was a culmination of a series of events leading to that moment. And video games are also tied to this moment in time in which they exist. A growing divide between sides of a debate in global politics, fueled by the awkward formatting of social media as well as a growing awareness and impatience with the plight of minorities and the strengthening of the voices for minority rights and thoughts. So are video games art? Well, I kind of have the same answer, but it's colored more by time. Video games are art, but they're not a culture. They exist as part of our culture. They are not an identity. They're an activity. They're not a cause. They are a medium for expressing causes. They are no one emotion, but have a potential for a range of emotions. And I think something that's really changed in my perspective since my talk in 2009 was that video games are not an industry. There is an industry that has shaped around them, but that is separate from the medium itself. So if I add to it this time, I would say video games are art, so let's talk about them like they are. <coughs> there you go. <laughs> and I could be wrong about everything.